Hi guys, uh, what I want to do is go over all the quizzes we've had this semester, including the ones that didn't get assigned, but that you can practice. Um, go through the solution and use that as an opportunity or allow you to use that as an opportunity for studying and practicing the basics um, in anticipation of the test. So here we go. Our very first quiz back when we were young it was lecture one, two. And each of the questions was basically the same question with some of the details changed. So you notice first we have a collection of high school students in Wisconsin. We asked whether they play video games and then they were given a blood test to measure their iron levels. So the two variables, whether they play video games and iron levels. And this last second sentence, I think I can highlight it, um, sort of. Researchers found that playing video games leads to on average higher in iron levels in parts per million. That means Playing video games is affecting or conjecturally affecting iron levels. So playing video games is the explanatory variable and um, iron levels is the response variable. Playing video games is a yes or no question. So the explanatory variable is binary categorical. Uh, I don't need to check each time, I'm sorry. Um, slightly different situation. Now there are shoppers in Tunxis Hill Stop and Shop whether they've been in the hospital, and then how many social contacts they have. Again, being in the hospital affects somehow social contacts. So the response variable is um, their number, total number of social contacts. Just to go through it, shoppers at the Tunxis Hill Stop and Shop is the population, I guess. The 12 shoppers they picked is the sample. If they'd ever been in the hospital is the explanatory and asking for their mobile phones to determine is sort of the measurement process. And being in the hospital led to on average same number of social contracts is the conclusion. One more time, now it's 32 residents in a retirement community, whether or not they wash hands after using the bathroom affects their knowledge of current events, who knows how. So the explanatory variable is whether or not they wash their hands um, after using the bathroom. All the others are the response, the sample, and so on. Okay. Now they're high school students in Wisconsin playing video games and how many sit-ups they can do. Is an experiment or an observational study this confuses people and let me say the best way, I think, to answer this is to ask yourself, how would I make it an experiment? Any study, the way to make it an experiment is to take a sample and then randomly assign each individual to have a certain value of the explanatory variable. In this case, the explanatory variable is whether or not they play video games. So an experiment would be to pick a bunch of people, make half of them play video games, and make half of them not play video games. Since you're not doing that, it's not an experiment. But notice there are two answers that say it's an observational study. One says it's an observational study because researchers did not decide if the subjects played video games. The other says the researchers did not decide if subjects um, what the subject's maximum number of sit-ups were. The second thing is about the response variable, not relevant to an experiment, only the explanatory variable. So it's C. Okay, now it's female undergraduates at Fairfield U, whether they've been at the hospital and current events. So now the response variable is their knowledge of current events and that's measured on a score of one to 100. So it is a numerical variable. Okay, looks like we did pretty well there. Lecture three. I'll try to keep track of which lecture or which quiz we're on so I don't do it twice. <clears throat> First question, we want to know the GPA of Fairfield U students, so we stop 160 students. First students who come out of the library, ask them their GPA, none refuse to answer. What's an example of sampling bias? Sampling bias, you need to identify a group more or less likely to be chosen. How are they chosen? We stop the first 160 people to come out of the library. And 
you need to identify how that group has a higher or lower GPA. And I asked you specifically to decide whether your estimate will be an under or an overestimate based on that um, sampling bias. If you can say that will make the, very, make the estimate higher or lower, then you have identified a source of bias. So in this case, who's more likely? Well, you know, I don't know how the people who you picked second, you know, who came out second whenever you showed up would differ, but people who come to the library at all is pretty clear. If you come to the library, you're more studious, more concerned about your studies, harder working, probably going to have a higher GPA. So library studious overestimate. Okay. That's probably all you need to say. Now we're looking at um, how many siblings left-handed adults have who live in New Haven have. I don't know why. You stop 54 left-handed adults at a CVS in New Haven and ask each how many siblings they have. Okay, so we're going to ask about the population, the variable, and the sample. Usually the easiest thing is the sample. The sample in this case is the 54 left-handed adults at a CVS in New Haven. That's unambiguous. What do you ask them? You ask them how many siblings they have. So that's the variable. The population is usually fuzzy. In this case, the sent first sentence identifies it. The population is all left-handed adults in New Haven because the problem says what we want to know about is all left-handed adults in New Haven. We usually, usually that's not clear, clearly specified, but here it is. Okay. If one of those you're not sure of, if you're a little unsure about the population in the sample, start with the variable. You know the variable is um, number of siblings. Go through. A, variable is all left-handed adults. Nope. B, the variable is the 54 left-handed adults. Nope. C, the variable is their number of siblings. So C could be right. D, variable all left-handed results. Nope. E, variable is the number of siblings. D, C, and E can be right. F is the sample. No. So it's either C or E. You can ignore the others. The population in C, the population is the 54 left-handed adults you asked in the CVS. Nope, that's the sample. So it must be E. Let's check. The population is all left-handed adults in New Haven. Yes. The variable's number of siblings. Yes. The sample is the 54 left-handed adults you asked. Yes. What's a possible potential source of sampling bias? We already said. It has to be a group of individuals more or less likely to be chosen and a direction in which they differ on the variable. So the choosing is um, more likely to be at the CVS and more likely to answer the poll. That's what A says. Um, and then arguing that they might have more or less number of siblings than typical. That's exactly a sampling bias. B. 54 is too small a sample to draw conclusions from? Yes, that's a question about the sample, but it's not a bias. It doesn't argue whether that would make people have more or fewer children, you know, siblings. Observing not all left-handed adults in New Haven ever go to the CVS? Yeah, that is a non-randomness about the sample, but again, no bias. Does not ident identify a way in which the variable is biased. Pointing out why left-handed adults in New Haven might over or underestimate their number of siblings, that's a measurement bias. Totally a bias, but measurement. And then finally, why the number of siblings might, might not be any different for left-handed adults in New Haven than other people. That's just saying, try a different population, nothing to do with the sampling. Finally, is it a random sample? No, we said it is not a random sample. I think we said this because not everybody is at the CVS. You're not going to get people who don't go to the CVS, so it's not a simple random sample. It is not a random sample. Is it obviously free of sampling bias? It's not obvious to me. Um, I can certainly drum up ways in which people who go to the CVS might have more siblings than other people. Um, but is it? it is definitely not a random sample. That is clear. Okay. Oops, I must have clicked on the wrong one. I'm going to check that. I, every once in a while, I just clicked the wrong thing.
Yeah, I meant to click on, this is not a random sample, but apparently I didn't, sorry. Um, okay, lecture four. So in this project, we wanna know whether Northeast college students' political affiliation influence their physical health. That's the initial question. I don't know what a political affiliation means. I don't know how you're gonna measure physical health. But then they turned it into a study. They went to all even numbered dorms and Campion. They asked each student who met the criteria, whether they were a Republican or a Democrat, that's now a precise explanatory variable, and how long it takes them to run a mile, that's now a precise response variable. So what's the measurement procedure? Once you picked an individual, what did you? You asked them, asked everyone who met the criteria, were they a Republican or a Democrat? And what time did they, did they run a mile? Um, okay, that's C. Determining whether the time in which they can run a mile was greater among those, that's sort of the precise question. Um, whether Northeast college students' political affiliations influence their physical health, that's the initial question. Time which they can run the mile, response. They went to all even numbered dorms in Campion, that's the sampling procedure. Okay. You don't have to go through this all the time you, if you see the right answer, but I thought it would be helpful to eliminate the others. Okay, now we wanna know whether college students preferred caffeinated beverage influences their stress. We're gonna to go to same place. Even number dorms in Campion, ask each person who meets the criterion whether they drink coffee. So that's a yes or no question. And we're in their experience stress level on a scale of one to 10. So the initial question is this first thing, whether college students preferred caffeinated beverage influences their stress. Um, B is the precise question. C is the explanatory variable. D is the response variable. And E is the, looks like both the sampling procedure and the measurement procedure. Okay, we're all done. Phew, got it right this time. Lecture five. Okay, now we're looking at this histogram. Number of kids. Now, let me point out, in any histogram, the x-axis is the values of variable. These are the possible answers to how many kids do you wanna have. The y-axis might be counts, it might be percentages, it might be decimals. The y-axis is not about the variable. It just tells you how many people or whatever's fit into each category. Okay, that is the biggest confusion. What does this histogram looks like, look like? It is clearly skewed right. It has this long tail to the right. And I would say it is bimodal. You've got one hump right at zero and then another hump at two. It is possible if this is really a very small sample and maybe that hump at two just represents one or two more people than at three, it doesn't look like it. You might argue against that, but I would say it's bimodal, but don't worry because if you look at the um, questions, bimodal and skewed right is one of the choices, unimodal and skewed right isn't. Okay, so in this case, the thing that maybe was a little ambiguous, you didn't have to worry about. This is an important thing to, to notice in these questions. If it looks like I'm asking you something ambiguous, maybe I am not actually asking you to make that distinction. What percentage of married couples in the sample have exactly one child? One child is this answer here at one, and the percentage, these are expressed as decimals. Maybe that was confusing, sorry. The percentage is the height, which looks like 0.16 to me, or 16%. And if you maybe you were off by one or two, that's no other answer is anywhere near that. So that should be fine. What percentage of married couples have less than two children? Okay, now notice that may sound complicated, but it's just saying the only way you can have less than two children is to have zero children or one. So I'm just asking you to add up the percentage who have zero and the percentage who have one. Zero looks like 27% to me. One looks like 16% to me. When you add these up, you get 
where did I go? I'm so sorry. Um, when you add these up, you get, there we go, too many screens open, 43, okay? And there's some error built in if your estimate differed from mine. Um, this variable, number of children, is a number. It's numerical, but it's discrete, right? Because you can't have a half a child. That was the whole quiz. Let's see how we did. Good. Lecture six. Okay, we got three numbers. The way you find the median is you put them in order. They're all the same, right? So it doesn't matter what order. The middle one is negative one. And the mean, minus one plus minus one plus minus one is minus three. Divide by three is minus one. This was a particularly easy example. Um, yours may have been a little different. Same histogram, number of children um, is the mean bigger than the median, the only way to, we know to tell that is to look at the skewness. Remember, it was right skewed. It had a long tail to the right. The tail pulls the mean towards it. So that means it's going to pull the mean up, and the mean will be bigger than the median. That's A. Mean is bigger than the median because the histogram is right skewed. Notice there's another answer, D. Mean is bigger than the median because the values of the y-axis are bigger than those in the x-axis. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, So you got to look at the whole sentence particularly if I say what's true and why, the reason matters. What's the actual value of the mean? Um, here, I'll go back. Um, so people have had trouble with this, but I think it's really pretty simple. Maybe coming back to it, it will seem simpler. If you made this out of wood, so this was just some histogram you could pick up and hand to a friend, you tried to balance it on your finger, where would you put your finger? I would put mine right around three, okay? So the long tail to the right will balance out the shorter stuff, but bigger to the left. Okay, so I'm going to guess somewhere around three. Three is one of the answers, and it says three because it is the balance point of the histogram. Now, maybe you saw it as four. That wouldn't be crazy, but the answer four does not have the right reason because it is the average of the number zero to eight. No, that's not that only, that only works for a uniform distribution. The long tail counts for less than the big fat stuff in the beginning. So four is wrong. These other questions also have silly reasons, but um, they're nowhere near the balance point. No, but you could not possibly balance the histogram on those points. So again, your estimate didn't have to be that accurate. Okay, submit quiz. Phew. And that was quiz six, so lecture seven. I'm really nervous about that because in, when I practiced, I kept missing quizzes and doing going back over the exact same quiz twice. Okay, we're looking at something that's roughly symmetric and unimodal, um, and we know it's mean and standard deviation. So that means we can use the empirical rule. The mean is 520. The standard deviation is 80. So up and down from 521 standard deviation would take you down to 440 and 600. And up and down two standard deviations would take you to uh, 360 and 680. Okay, so this first question, what fraction would fall between 440 and 600? That's one standard deviation within one standard deviation is two thirds of the data. 95% of the data, the second question, covers two standard deviations. And we said that was between 360 and 680. What fraction of all SAT scores would you expect to be less than 760? 760 is three standard deviations above 520. It's 520 plus, um, uh, 240. So three standard deviations is basically the top. So almost everything is less than that. Almost all. How about more than 360? 
360 we saw was two standard deviations. So 95% of the data is between 360 and 680. It's going to be more than that. How much more? Well, the remaining 5% is in these two tails. So one of the tails is included and one's not. So 95 plus two and a half is 97.5%. Okay, so you can reason out any between any two of the values mean, mean plus or minus one, two or three standard deviations. Great. Okay, lecture eight. Also, um, is looking at uh, distribution. Uh, first, it's looking at quartiles. The first quartile is 4.5, the median is 6.5, and the third quartile is 8.5. So between 6.5 and 8.5, between the median and the third quartile, is 25%. 50% would be between the first quartile and the third, 4.5 and 8.5. That's C. Look at the answers carefully. I messed this up by not being careful. <clears throat> okay, we're back to SAT scores, verbal this time, symmetric and unimodal. Same mean and standard deviation. They're supposed to vary. This verbal SAT score of 400 is how many standard deviations above the mean? That's the same as asking what's the z-score. So I take 400, the value, minus 520, the mean, that's negative 120, and I divide that by the standard deviation 80, and I get minus 1.5. I'm supposed to do it to one decimal place, so that's exactly right. Is this z-score unusual? All that matters is, is it between minus two and two? It is, so it's usual. Um, no, this falls in the range of z-scores considered usual. Um, the other no has the wrong reason. The distribution is roughly normal and symmetric and unimodal, so it is normal. That's true, but normal is not the same thing as normal distribution is not the same thing as usual value. <clears throat> okay, we're on a roll. Lecture nine we did not uh, assign, but it's good practice even better practice since you haven't done it yet. Um, you might want to skip over this, try it, and then, then look at the solution. <clears throat> so we're interested in how gender affects washing hands. Gender is explanatory, washing hands is response. You have a sample of 250 men and 270 women, 60, 161 men wash their hands, 225 women do. The response variable is whether you wash your hands. Okay. Gender is the explanatory. A, the A and C are just counts of things. They're not variables or anything. Whether gender affects hand washing is the precise question, and gender is the explanatory. Down here, the conditional proportions are always the counts. So men who wash their hands, for instance, is 161 divided, divided by the total for the explanatory. So total divided by the total number of men. So this is the percentage of men who wash their hands is 161 divided by 250. I get 0.644, which is 64.4%. It says one decimal place. I didn't have to round. The percentage who don't wash their hands, well, you could subtract 250 minus 161 and then divide by 250, or you could just say, oh, it's the remainder. So if you take away 64.4, you have 35.6 left. For women, 225 women wash their hands. That's out of a total of 270 women. So that's 83.333%. So I round that to 83.3. Remember, you always take it to one more decimal point, and then you round up or down. <clears throat> Women who don't wash their hands would be the difference, which is 16.7%. Okay, let's see how we did. Oh, I got it all right. Okay, lecture 10. Are we at scatter plot scatter plots yet? Yes, 
scatter plots. We're looking at scatter plot A. That is clearly a positive association. I think it's pretty clearly linear. It follows, I think it follows closest as a straight line. And it's quite weak. There's a lot of variation up and down around the line. By contrast, here's scatter plot B. It's negative association. It also pretty clearly follows an underlying line, but it sticks very close to it. It is a strong association. So scatter plot, I don't know why this is already clicked. Um, which scatter plots have a positive relationship? Scatter plot A only. A is positive, B is negative. Which has the stronger relationship? Scatter plot B was stronger, A was weak. Okay, so that means that A is going to have a positive R value, but small, close to zero. B is going to have a negative R value, and because it's a strong relationship, it should be close to negative one. Okay, scatter plot A has R equals one, clearly wrong. B has R equals 0 0.05, that looks reasonable, but scatter plot B has R equals zero, nope. A has R equals 0 0.05, that looks pretty reasonable, and B has R close to negative one, that looks right. And let's check D. A has R is negative almost one, nope. And then are the relationships curved or linear? They're both roughly linear. Okay. Those are all interpretive questions. So they went pretty quick. Let's look at lecture 11. Another scatter plot question. Um, now about the interpretation of the slope, the y-intercept and r squared. So we wanna know how your grandparents' income affects your income. So we take a sample of 40 New Englanders, we ask them, salary of their highest earning grandparent in thousands of dollars. And then we ask them their salary in thousands of dollars. So if you answer 50, that means $50,000. Here's the least squares line, y equals 0.09x minus 19 and r squared equals 0.132. What does x represent? x always represents the explanatory variable, the thing doing the affecting, which is the grandparent's income. So the salary in thousands of dollars of their highest earning grandparent, that's A, okay? That's the precise version of the explanatory variable. B is, if you look at it, is the interpretation of R squared. C is the response variable. And I believe D is the interpretation of the slope, okay? And noticing those will make answering the future questions easier because they all come up. Um, so for each additional something, you can expect on average some additional amount of something else is clearly the interpretation of the slope. For each additional one of the explanatory, so each additional $1,000 in your subject's grand, of the subject's grandparent salary, you can expect on average slope, which is 0 0.09 additional, the response variable, which is thousands of dollars in your salary. So, your grandparents earned $10,000 more than me, I would expect you to earn $900 more than me. <clears throat> if they earned $10,000 more than my grandparents, is what I meant to say. Okay, the least squares line suggests that on average, a subject for which the salary in thousands of dollars of their highest earning grandparent was zero would have the y-intercept. What you get when you plug x equals zero in here, which is minus $19,000. Minus $19,000, that doesn't make any sense, presumably because zero was not part, not anywhere near the X values for which you had data, because nobody has an income of zero. Um, the percentage variation in the sub subject's salary in thousands can be explained by its linear relationship with the salary in thousands of their highest earning grandparent. That is exactly the interpretation of R squared. R squared as a decimal is 0.132. So R squared as a percentage, how it was expressed here is 13.2. Great, and now let's look at lecture 12. This was about uh, outliers and residuals. We had the graph, the scatter plot, 
of Obama's approval, y-axis. Percentage of people saying, yes, I approve of how President Obama is doing, x-axis. Percentage of people, I approve of how he is doing on the economy. Um, and each dot represents a different survey. We don't know when, but during the course of his term. And you can see that the more people like how he's doing on the economy, the more they like how he's doing in general. It does a really good job of predicting because most of what people care about from the president is how they think he's doing on the economy. But we have some outliers. Upper right hand corner, we have these three points whose y values are between 66 and 69, whose x values look like they're between 58 and 60. Their y values are quite a bit bigger than any other y values. The next y value is it's 59. So they are outliers in the y direction. Their x values, 58, 60, are a bit bigger than any other x values. So they are outliers in the x direction. Their residuals are not that big. There are a few points above the straight, above the linear regression line. So probably not um, outliers, regression outliers. Okay. These three points in the upper right hand corner are outliers in the x direction, outliers in the y direction, but not regression outliers. That's C. Okay. All the others, in fact, I think none of the others even says that it outlier in the y direction, which is the most clear cut. So those are definitely the best answer. The dot, the green dot labeled Osama bin Laden killed, OBL killed, it was when the terrorist Osama bin Laden was killed by our uh, army rangers, I think, or Navy SEALs, something like that. And you can see that this is far above the least squares line. In fact, his approval was 56. If you drop down here to the line, you would expect his overall approval based on his economic approval to be something like 46 or 47. Okay, so the residual is nine or 10. What is it exactly? I don't know, but I don't need to. Oh, whoops, um, I, I jumped ahead. So I'll answer this one. The residual is 9.5. If you got nine or 10, that's way closer than any of the others. So that's, that. again, your estimation is totally good enough. But first I was supposed to say, what kind of residual is it? It is clearly regression outlier. It's way above the line. Um, it is, but its Y value is not that high. There are other points that have higher Y value. So its Y value is high for X, but its Y value is not that high. So it is not an outlier in the Y direction, not an outlier in the X direction. It's in pretty much the middle of the X values. Um, and it is probably not influential. Remember a regression outlier that's kind of in the middle is not influential and towards the edges is. Doesn't look like it's really bending the line towards it. Um, so we answered, it is a regression outlier, but not an outlier in the X or Y direction and probably not influential. I thought that was kind of an, an in-between one. And then why is this, do you have this big residual? An out, of, of an out regression outlier should have an explanation why it doesn't fit the pattern. And here it's pretty clear when, when a famous terrorist the government had been trying to get for years was captured, killed, um, his approval rating spiked. People were much happier with his performance, but it didn't change their opinion of his economic performance because it's not about the economy. It was the rare non-economic thing that mattered dramatically to people up that the president could control. A relatively rare occurrence. So that was A. News of this huge non-economic success raised people's view of the overall job performance without affecting their view of his economic performance. And Oops, let's go back and see what I got wrong. I clicked on 9.5. It robbed me. Um, so 9.5 was the correct answer. Alrighty, now let's look at 13, which was the um, 
probability quiz. Oh, this was the Katy Perry quiz. So here's the table. What's the probability a randomly selected activity will occur on last Friday night? Eight occurred on last Friday night out of a total of 40. Eight divided by 40 is 20%. It's supposed to be the one decimal place, but I did not need to worry about that. What's the probability it will not involve breaking the law? 12 of the events involve breaking the law. So that left 28 that were law abiding. 28 divided by 40 is 70%. And again, did not have to do any rounding. I could also have done 12 out of 40 and then subtracted it from one or 100%. What's the probability will involve glitter on the floor and will have have laugh, happened last Friday night? That happened four times. That's what this number here represents. But it's still out of the total, out of all 40. So four out of 40 is 10%. Then I ask, involves glitter on the floor or will have happened last Friday night? So that involves this 16, this four, this one, and this three. Um, you can make it a little easier on yourself by saying it involves the eight that happened last Friday night, as well as the 16 that involved glitter on the floor and didn't involve last Friday night. Either way, you get 24. 24 divided by 40 is 60%. So my numbers have worked out so nicely, I have never had to um, show you an example of rounding up. But if I had gotten, say, 56.777 or 56.666, like in two thirds, you would round that to 56.7 because the second six brings the first six up to seven. Okay, and finally, which of the following events are disjoint from last Friday night? Disjoint means they can't happen together. Last Friday night and glitter on the floor happened four times. Broke the law happened once. Kissed but forgot happened three times. None of those are disjoint but last Friday night and other nights can't possibly come together. So those are disjoint. Okay, and our very last quite hard quiz was 13.5. We're popping peanuts in our mouth. 6% chance of catching it each time, so you're pretty good at this. What's the chance you would not catch it? 1 minus 0.06 is 0.94 or 94%, right? We use the complement rule. If each try is independent and you try twice, what's the chance of catching both? So it's 6% and 6%. If they're independent, you multiply for end. So I do 0.06 as a decimal times 0.06, and I get 0.0036 which is 0.36, and it says to two decimal places, so I'm good. Um, oops, wrong, wrong place though. 0.36 is um, chance of catching both. The chance of catching neither would be missing the first and missing the second, 0.94 times 0.94. That is 88.36. Oh. So 88.36%, two decimal places so we don't have to round. Okay, now we get, life gets tricky. You catch the first and miss the second. Well, that's actually not that tricky. Catch the first is 6%, miss the second is 94%. And when they're independent, you multiply. So 0 0.06 times 0 0.94 is 5.64%. And now I ask a funny question. What's the chance of getting exactly one peanut? So we know 5.64% of the time, you catch the first and miss the second. How about miss the first and catch the second? Same thing. That's 5.64% because it's 0.94 times 0.06. So you have about a 5.6 chance of getting one the first way and a 5.6 chance of getting one the other way, and they're disjoint. They're two different possibilities. So you have to add 5.64 plus 0.94 plus 0.96 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 plus 0
plus 5.64, or you can multiply by two, and you get 11.28. So we had to use both the product rule and the sum rule. Okay, so now we've got three MacBook Airs. One's fully charged and two are not. So to begin with, you pull one computer out, one out of three is charged. So the probability is one third or 33.3 .3 to one decimal place. If you pull two of them out at random, what's the probability both will be charged? It's impossible, right? There's only one computer that's charged. So after you pull the one out, there are none that are left that are charged. So the answer is zero. So this wouldn't happen to be a little easier. But normally, if there were, say, five fully charged out of seven, you'd have five sevenths. And now there'd be four left out of six. It would be five sevenths times four sixths, or whatever your numbers are. What's the probability both are not charged? So the first one is two out of three, so two over three. The second one, there's only one left, one uncharged and one not charged. And now it's one out of two. So it's two thirds times one half, which is one third or 33.3%. And let's see what I got wrong on. Not letting me go back. Um, oh, well, I think I clicked on the wrong thing. So, or perhaps I miscalculated, sorry. Okay, I hope that that helps. I hope that gives you a little bit of a uh, um, sense of the kind of things I might ask. In addition to thinking about the quizzes and similar problems, also think about the worksheets and of course the practice test. The solutions have been posted for the practice test. Um, and those would be my highest recommendations for studying.